All right, finish the sentence for me. Let's see now who can relate to what I'll be talking about tonight. Revenge is, oh, you need this badly. I can, <laughs> I can tell you need this badly. Revenge is sweet. You know, we've all heard or probably experienced the, power, the powerful feeling of payback time. It's payback time. And if we haven't, I'm sure that there are times when we have truly wanted to get even. It's just, you know, natural human emotion. Several years ago, a friend of mine, preacher that many of us know here, Kent Allen, presented a lesson about this, getting even, you know, without getting into trouble. And I want to share some of the points he brought up, some other ideas about this particular phenomenon, something we all experience one time or another in our lives, and that is you know, the problem of revenge. Revenge. The desire for revenge is really a mixture of two emotions. Anger on one side and the need for justice. And you take anger and the need for justice and you mix those two together and you've got this thing called revenge. Anger, because someone has probably done something to us that we perceive as unkind, unfair, insulting, unjust, whatever. Someone or a corporation, a company, whatever, the business, our employer, someone has done something to us which is, it's wrong. And then there's a need for justice because we want to make things right. We uh, want to restore our property or our reputation or uh, uh, we want to restore a position that we may have lost because of what that person has said or done to us. Now the problem with revenge is that it's, it's so subjective. That's the main problem with it. There are other things, but it's so subjective. I mean, only the person getting the revenge decides just how much pain and for how long they're going to you know, afflict the other person. And only the person getting the revenge decides if the punishment is truly justified or not. You know, when they say revenge, you're the judge, you're the jury, you're the executioner, that's the problem, it's too subjective. You're in control of all of the pain, you know, the application of the pain. Now in the Old Testament, God provided guidelines to prevent the abuses that occurred because of unbridled revenge. And Jesus refers to this in Matthew chapter five, you know, verse 38, when he says, you know, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Now some people think this is a biblical permission, you know, somehow they have permission from the Bible to seek revenge. You know, hey, it says, you know, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, I'm allowed to get revenge, the Bible says so. Of course, that's not true, not accurate. This command, if you wish, was part of a basic judicial system given by God to help regulate disputes and help regulate injuries. The point of that passage, the point was that repayment for injury or offense had to be made proportionately you paid back in quality and sometimes in greater quantity, but there was a limit to the payback. There was a limit to the justice in order to discourage abuse, the idea, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. You know, they're not talking to plucking out an eye, they're saying, you know, in the system of justice, you must require something which is equal to what you've lost. So a fair way of receiving justice was needed because of the emotional factor involved when injustice took place. And the problem, of course, was that angry people, they tend to want a lot of justice. And they want to have a lot of pain in payment for their sufferings. So this is why laws were developed in order to be fair, both to the victims and to the guilty party as well. Now, what a lot of people don't recognize, however, is that revenge harms the person who seeks it as much as the person who receives it. Both people are in danger of being harmed disproportionately. 
Yeah, revenge is sweet, but only for a little while. It's true that revenge is sweet, but not, not on the long term. Paul the Apostle talks about this subject in Romans chapter seven, uh, 12, verse 17 to 21, and he enumerates some of the things that happens to the one who takes revenge. So let's read that, shall we? Chapter 12, Romans, beginning in verse 17. He says the following, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Stop. <laughs> What's the first word there? Never. Not if you feel like it, if it's right, if, you, if it's just. He says never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Again, he says in 19, never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him, and if he is thirsty, give him a drink, for in so doing you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So according to this passage, when I take revenge, here are a couple of things that I end up doing. Number one, I disobey God because He says, never take revenge. So I disobey God. Disobeying God, regardless of the reasons, will bring His judgment upon us. So the question we should ask ourselves is, is this revenge really going to be worth it? Revenge is sweet for a small time, but do I really want to open myself up to the judgment of God for what I've done? No matter how justified I feel in doing it? Secondly, when I take revenge, I destroy the power of love. Offenses, injustice, unkindness is to be countered, Paul says, with love. Not more offenses, more injustice, and greater unkindness. The thing about revenge is that it has never improved someone else. The victim of revenge, no matter what they've ever done, never gets better because revenge has been <laughs> foisted on them. Revenge never changes, never improves. Revenge never leads to love. Revenge never leads to peace, never. And three, according to Paul, when I take revenge, I defeat my own purpose. If I want to settle a matter, believe me, revenge is not the way to do it. Revenge usually escalates the argument into a war. I mean, all we have to do is look at the, the news. Every couple of months, a Palestinian you know, in Israel, in the you know, West Bank in Israel, and so on and so forth, so someone on the pa Palestinian side shoots a bomb or something into uh, you know, a neighborhood in Israel and some people get hurt. And then the Israelis go back and they kill five Palestinians. I'm not taking sides here now. I'm not, you know, I'm not taking sides. I'm just saying this is what we see in the news, right? And so then the Palestinian straps a bomb to himself and he goes and he blows himself up inside of a, a bus carrying kids. Oh yeah, well the Israelites go back and you know, they, they've got planes and everything and they bomb you know, houses and neighborhoods. And the Palestinian, you know, it goes back and forth and back. You, if you want to see the case study for the results of revenge, just observe what is taking place in Israel and what has taken place there for decades. Revenge, seating, re see the problem is both sides believe in the eye for an eye. You hurt me, I hurt you, and look what it's gotten them. Not only look what it's gotten them, 
Look what it's got in the rest of the world. I mean, how many times are we on the edge of being at war with people because of what's going on in this country that's, you know, we could take this country, we could put it inside the state of Oklahoma and lose it. This tiny little strip of land and yet it's like a, a, a flashpoint for wars between other people. Why? Because you have two nations bent on visiting revenge upon each other. I mean, that's the perfect, the perfect example. And then of course when I take revenge, a fourth thing according to the passage here, is I defy God's authority. God is the only one who is strong enough, good enough, fair enough to execute final and complete justice. I'm not saying that we can't seek justice and protection through the law, because the law is part of God's system. But doing it through personal revenge violates God's system and makes us as guilty as the one who offended us in the first place. No win there. Some may say, well, what if the laws are poor or inadequate? then I believe our energies, therefore, should be invested in changing and improving the laws if we can, not in revenge taking. You know, one of the things that has come out in the last years, last decades, have been the, uh, you know, the victim impact statements at criminal trials. There was a cry there that you know, the, the, the criminals, they're getting all the advantages and you know, they're not, un, you know, the, the judges and the juries are not understanding uh, 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 clearly the impact on the victims that these criminals have, you know, have, have, have made with what they've done. And so instead of taking revenge on the criminal, revenge on the offender, you know, somebody taking justice into their own hands, there was a movement to bring the point of view of the victim into the courtroom. And now we have victim impact statements before the sentences are prescribed for the criminals. I think it's uh, uh, obviously it doesn't bring back or change you know, what has taken place, but it allows the victims to say openly to the offenders, this is what you've done to me. This is how what you have done has you know, impacted my family. And remember, many times the judge is listening to this and so is the jury as they deliberate as to what is the proper just punishment for the crime that has been committed. In some places, you know, maybe there is no law or the law is oppressive. And in these, place, in these cases, I'm, I'm made aware of two things. You know, when I think about places where there's lawlessness or oppression, when I see these places, the first thing I think of is how blessed I am to be in a free and democratic country and how I should support and protect the freedom that I do have. And I also think how the first century Christians trusted in God to overthrow their Roman oppressors, which he did eventually without Christians becoming insurrectionists and terrorists. Christians are not called on to be rebels and anarchists. That's not our call. We're here to build the kingdom of heaven on earth regardless of the type of rule that exists at the time. Some people say, man, we're going to hell in a handbasket. You know, this country and things are going to happen and blah, blah, blah. And you know, maybe one day we'll be an Islamic state or, you know, they'll, or we'll be a super leftist socialist state and everything will be bad and blah, blah, blah. And what are you going to do, Mike? And my answer, uh, what I've been doing for the last 36 years, preaching the gospel, teaching the Bible, bringing souls to Christ, trying to find the, 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 a platform that gives me a large voice so that I can say to the world, you guys better come out of the world and into the kingdom. You need to leave this place behind. That's what I'll do. What is going to change? For me, nothing. Other than maybe I'll be more oppressed because of saying that. Well, you know, that's the, that's the thing we have to accept if we become Christians. 
You know, we always think in season and out of season, and we think that in season and out of season simply means sometimes they're listening to us and sometimes they're not listening to us. Yeah, it means that, but it also means sometimes they let us preach and sometimes they kill us for preaching. So I'm just happy that I'm living at a time when I get to preach without getting killed for it. But hopefully we would all be ready to continue doing what we're doing despite what the government would want to do. Because governments will always do what they do. My job is not to change the government. My job is to change hearts and minds and warn the world that there's a judgment coming. That's my job. That's your job. That's our job. That's the role of the church. It's good that we have stuff going on. We have picnics. We have all this kind of stuff going on. Yeah, that's great. That's wonderful. Fellowship, we love it. But that's not what we're about. That's not what we're about. We're about telling people that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and salvation is only through Him. And you better be careful because there's a judgment coming. Either God comes for you now through death or you will go to Him as He comes and returns to the earth to judge it. That's what we're about. That's what we do. So what's the cure for revenge? Sorry, I kind of drifted a little bit there. What's the cure for revenge? Well, not taking revenge doesn't mean doing nothing. There are other options open for one who has been injured or offended or treated unfairly. There are proactive things to do aside from taking revenge. What are those? Well, first, you can ignore the offense. You can ignore it. Solomon says, a fool shows his annoyance at once, but a prudent man overlooks an insult. I like that proverb. Another proverb that also says, it is to a man's glory to overlook an offense. That one is more comforting to me. God, my Father, is saying to me, Michael, it is to your glory at this moment to overlook the offense that has been you know, made towards you at this time. We can either make an issue out of an insult and deal with all the consequences or we can simply ignore it. We can make a big deal out of it or no deal out of it. We get to choose that part. You know, there's a great comfort in knowing that it requires as much self-control, as much courage, as much self-confidence to ignore as to confront. The difference is that when you ignore, you demonstrate your strength without a single word. And you please God with your Christ-like attitude. That's the difference. I'm not out to win, I'm out to please. I want to please God with what I do. Number two, you know, proactive, instead of taking revenge, how about simply forgiving the hurt? Paul said, bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, Colossians 3.13. Can it be any clearer? The problem, of course, is the, what, what do we do with the hurt? You understand the, the intellectual part. He said this or she said this about me or that and that's not true and blah, blah, blah. Okay, I can deal with that. They're mistaken. They talk too fast. That's what they do all the time. I can do that intellectually. But what do you do with, in here? The hurt. You know, what do you do with that? That thing. Because if we do nothing, we have to carry around this burden of this thing inside of us. Forgiveness is the answer, not revenge, because what we do is we pay off the debt ourselves and let the burden go. In other words, that thing there that you did to me, you owe me because of that. You owe me something. 
I can think a way and I can intellectualize a way and I can rationalize a way that what you said, you, you were angry, you were dumb, you don't know, you're uninformed, whatever. I can intellectualize all of that stuff, but I can't intellectualize the pain. What do I do with the pain? Who's going to pay me for the pain? I can't let go of the pain until somebody has paid. Revenge wants somebody to pay with pain, with money, so we can ourselves give permission to let go of the feeling. So forgiveness says no charge no charge, and unloads the feeling. When I stop looking for payment, I stop feeling bad. I feel bad because I want payment. If we lack motivation to forgive, we simply have to look at the sins that Christ forgave us with His pain on the cross. If He was willing to say to me, no charge, then we as Christians are called upon to do the same with those who cause us pain. No charge. You don't owe me anything. You don't owe me anything. And I'll give you a kind of a, an, emotional, uh, a, an emotional tip. When you say no charge, when you say I'm forgiving that person, they don't have to be there and then give it at least 24 hours, because it takes at least 24 hours to begin whew, siphoning off the pain. Okay? And then what else do I do proactively? What else can I do? Well, I can serve that person. I can serve them. This idea defies conventional wisdom, which says, don't get mad, get even. Proverbs 25, verse 21 and two says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. In doing this, you'll heap burning coals on his head and the Lord will reward you. Exactly what Paul quotes here. Some people, you know, they find it hard to imagine inviting their enemies home for dinner. Uh, but the Bible uses this language to encourage us to be kind to our enemies as a way of disarming them and making them vulnerable not to us, making them vulnerable to the gospel because guilty consciences produced by the word and the spirit become amenable to hearing the words of Christ. Some practical ways that this can be done. Pray for their well-being. The guy that caused me pain, I got to do something. I got to do something. So I pray for him. I'll tell you something. It's very hard to hate somebody that you're praying for. <laughs> it's very hard to maintain a grudge against somebody that you're appealing to God to help them, to forgive them, to bless them. Very hard to hate that person. And try to look for opportunities to serve them in some way and then follow through and show them that you bear no ill will or desire for revenge. You know, I'm thinking of Nelson Mandela, you know, the uh, South African uh, politician at the end, of course, but he spent 20 plus years in prison in South Africa put there by racist leaders at the time. And then through a series of events, I think we all know this, he eventually was released and eventually became the president of that country. <laughs> Imagine, you guys put me in jail unjustly for 20 years. Now I'm the president and I'm in charge of the police. 
<laughs> and I'm in charge of the army, I got the big stick now. And what did he do? Nothing. He even agreed for a time to co-lead the country with the man that actually sent him to jail. I'm not talking about the jail for three days or nine months, 20 long years in a miserable jail, the best part of his youth and manly strength wasted in jail. And why do we consider him great, Mandela, why? Because he didn't take revenge and he could have. And he could have, but he didn't do it because he did not want to repeat the cycle of violence and hatred that had sent him to jail in the first place. And you know what really, really knocks me for a loop about Nelson Mandela? He was not a believer. <laughs> we, we, we've got the motivation that the Almighty God wants us to do this. That was not his motivation. He was not a believer in God. He was a communist early on, but he loved this country, that's for sure. And he loved his people. And it was the love of his country and the love of his people that moved him towards forgiveness. How much greater is our motivation? Our love of Almighty God, our love of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ should motivate us to the same, shouldn't it? Loving enemies is a sure sign to them and to God that our faith is not only sincere but powerful as well, powerful enough to stop a cycle of hatred and revenge. And then one other thing perhaps that we can do proactively instead of revenge, love their souls, love their souls. We deal with the issue by ignoring the offense and forgiving the hurt. We deal with the individual by serving them as people and loving their souls. Paul said, but God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 7 and 8. Jesus' sacrifice was not done to make His followers rich or comfortable in this world, it was done to guarantee their entry into the next world. People who have hurt us have sinned, and exacting revenge, no matter how justified, will do little to save their souls. In ignoring and forgiving and serving them, we can lead them to repentance and ultimately to faith and salvation. What a blessed revenge it is to bring your enemy to Christ <laughs> for their good. When that happens, they will weep and they will love you like no one else will ever love you because of what you have done for them. Revenge is sweet, but bringing your enemy to Christ, transforming them into a fellow Christian is so much sweeter and so much more satisfying. So the title of this lesson is somewhat misleading. You rarely get even without getting into trouble. <laughs> Rarely. As Christians, our goal in life is not to get even. We want to get ahead in our spiritual lives. That's our goal. Offenses and injustices are often the things that God allows us to come our way in order to test our faith and to promote our spiritual growth. It requires spiritual maturity to resist the temptation to seek revenge, but the reward if we accomplish it, is peace of mind and favor with God and favor with those around you, including your enemies. You know, most wars would be over in a heartbeat without the thirst for revenge fueling the violence. 
And so I encourage us to remember these things and adopt the attitude that I've spoken about tonight. The next time we are provoked or hurt by our spouses or our friends or our coworkers, even strangers. What did we read about this weekend? I saw on the news, a man's in a car with his little boy and little girl and some other man cuts him off on the road and he makes a sign or a shout or something to take revenge on the offense of cutting him off. And the man in the other car is offended and angry and pulls out a gun and shoots at the car and kills the other man's little boy. And they're interviewing the man you know, who was offended because this guy cut him off and he even flipped him off or something. And he was weeping, his little boy is dead, shot dead, while sitting next to his sister. And he was saying, well, he had no words. What if I had just said nothing? What if I had just overlooked the offense? He didn't say that, but that's what he was trying to say. So let's remember the things that I've talked about tonight. And if we have struggled with resentments or desire for revenge, why not leave all those at the cross of Christ tonight? Why not? As we sing the song of encouragement, you don't need to come forward if that's what you need to do. The Lord knows who you are and He knows the burden in your heart. Why don't you come forward to the cross? and leave all those burdens and those hurts and those insults, leave them there. If on the other hand, of course, if you need to come to Christ because you've not been to Him yet in repentance and baptism, of course, please do that as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.